All right, folks, welcome everybody. Thank you uh, for coming out today on behalf of uh, Nagios. My name is Emmett, I'm the announcer today. Um, we'll be doing some uh, Q&A, some uh, about 10 minute questions towards the end of this uh, presentation. But uh, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, put your hands together for Robert Bolton, Systems Administrator at the University of Utah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Bolton. I'm a Systems Administrator at the University of Utah. I'll just a little tell you a bit about where I work at, what I do, and you know, a little bit of personal information about me. Uh, I work for the Center for High Performance Computing on the campus of the University of Utah. We are essentially, I like to refer to us as the Research IT Department. Uh, our, we, our university is a research institution. We have a research hospital and just traditional research in, in several different fields. Our department is in charge of the computational clusters and you know, researchers, they have interesting things they're trying to research. They use computers in interesting ways that do not fit in the normal campus infrastructure. So they come to us to help solve their problems. And this creates a lot of interesting uh, things that we have to monitor that just, you know, we have trouble because we can't find, you know, Nagios plugins out there that allow us to monitor you know, certain things. So we've been able to uh, extend o um, SNMP to be, allow us to monitor things that you normally wouldn't think about. Uh, just a little bit about me. I like to code stuff in Python. So this is a talk about Python uh, and the, particularly the SNMP pass uh, persist module that allows you to update uh, OIDs. Uh, I'm also, go, you know, working at a university has some benefits too. So I'm actually going to school part time. I'm deciding between computer engineering, electrical engineering, I haven't really decided. And going part time, I have no idea when I'm going to graduate. Uh, I did notice that people in IT tend to have some kind of geek credibility, whether they like you know, fantasy novels or comic books. I like board games, and I'm a ham radio operator. And I, I think that's enough geek cred about me. <laughs> All right, so let's, enough about me. Let's talk about what you guys came to hear about. And that's uh, creating a, um, custom OIDs so that you can extend your monitoring environment. Uh, things we're going to cover today, you know, why bother doing this? Uh, we're going to cover the OIT structure because if you decide, hey, I want to create some custom OIDs, where am I going to stick them at? Uh, we're going to cover the uh, Python module that allows you to do this. And I'm going to give you a real, a real world example using IO stat uh, statistics for di uh, file system disk and it, so that you'll be able to understand where we we had an issue with this and how we solved it using uh, custom OIDs. So the first thing you want to think about is why do I want to do this? Uh, SNMP, for one thing, it's simple to, to gather data from it. And simple is in quotations because if you've ever messed with SNMP, you'll know that sometimes it works a little bit and sometimes it doesn't give you the results that you're looking for. Uh, it, it's essentially a server says, hey, give me this information here, and the other server says, okay, I'll pass it to you. But sometimes they don't talk on the uh, same wavelength, it seems. Uh, another thing, you, you probably wonder, why would I want to do this? I mean, if I'm using Nagios, there's probably a plugin out there, and if there's not, it's pretty simple to write a plugin to gather the information you need. But it doesn't allow you to sometimes pass off that information and share that information between uh, not only Nagios, but we also, you know, use Cacti to historically track what happens. So a Nagios plugin might be great for gathering data that you need for um, Nagios, but how, how do you get that information into Cacti to, uh, you know, to be able to trend that? Um, a good example is if we, you know, using NRPE to execute a, a remote command on a, a server will give you the result that you're looking for to, to say, oh, is this, you know, is this, at a state that I expect it to be at, whereas that doesn't really translate to um, this, you know, this state or this value doesn't really translate very well to a different system such as, you know, cacti. Um, also, it gives a chance to offload time-consuming system checks. And what I mean by that is I have a, a few scripts that go out there and do some weird stuff. Like, for instance, I have a script that goes out and monitors the temperature sensor of all 500 compute nodes in one of our clusters so that I can create a weather map and determine where the hot spots are uh, with airflow flowing into that, custom, on that, on that cluster. It takes about 15 minutes to run because querying the, uh, the little drag that's on the uh, servers takes a while. And you obviously could not do that 
in the time window of or cacti, for instance, or even nagios, unless you had some enormous window that you were going to do. And also, I have another strip that goes out and queries every network they have, how many devices are on that, and that takes about five minutes to run. And like I said, that you know that taking that outside of Nagios or outside of your monitoring software allows it to uh, you know not get bogged down with useless checks, or not, not I shouldn't say useless, but time-consuming checks that the system might otherwise deem as. Um, you know, you'll have to wait for this one before I can go to the process, and that can, you know, fill up the queue quite quickly. Um, also, using custom OIDs, you can provide information that's not normally inside of the uh, OID tree. The OID tree consists of a lot of information, such, you know, like interface statistics. You can gather, um, you know, memory, CPU utilization, stuff like that out of the tree. But there's other things that we have discovered that we'd want that isn't in the tree that we have to put there ourselves. So let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about the tree structure. I have this uh, nice little graphic I found that it, um, shows a little bit about it. You might be a little bit familiar with some of the, the top of the tree. If you've worked with SNMP enough, you'll start to notice numbers. And you, if you get really good at it, you can look at a number and tell exactly what it is. I'm not at that level, and I don't know if anybody is in here. But if you are, that's pretty impressive. So the first thing you'll notice is that we have the root of the tree. Uh, tree being in an in, in inverted sense here, but so you'll notice that 1.3.6.1, you'll notice that a lot is, you know, that's pretty much a good indication of, you know, what the base of every OID is. And, in, you know, as it flows down here, there's different levels. Uh, what we're going to prim primarily focus on is after um, the internet level, where it starts to branch out, there's a, uh, a dot four, which this is the private branch of the tree. And this is where we're going to stick our custom OIDs. And the reason we do that is uh, if, you, if you're querying an OID, it will respond to whatever OID. It'll give you information. And if you stick some custom information in there, it'll respond with that custom information, which is, is fine if that's the, w the way you want to run your environment. But if you're producing a product and you just pick some OID willy-nilly, you might be overriding something that's, uh, you know, a standard, like an interface statistic. So that's why you'll see a lot of, if you look at the OID tree, you'll see a lot of vendors, they'll put their stuff under four. Uh, we'll put our custom OIDs under four, just so we don't clobber, you know, you know, things. And there's also an experimental branch, too. And I've seen people stick stuff in the experimental branch, and they think, well, it's experimental, I'll just stick it there, whatever. Uh, sometimes vendors will say, well, I want to offer these statistics in this experimental branch, so that I can just, you know, that's one more thing, I, feature I can brag about. So that's why I like to put it in the uh, four structure as opposed to somewhere else. Uh, if you're a vendor or you work for one, it's not that difficult for your, your company to go out and get a uh, dedicated number. Like, for instance, since, um, you know, we use 4.1234 as our, you know, our top of our tree. But if, you, you know, if you're a vendor, you can go out and get whatever you would like, and um, you'll see a lot of vendors, you know, like APCs in there, Dell, Juniper, stuff like that. They all have uh, branches in their, for their statistics in that, along with other standard statistics that they're offering through, like, you know, interface statistics for, for Cisco, for example. All right. Uh, this slide pretty much covers up, covers anything I didn't mention there. Uh, numbers correspond to a location, so kind of like a street address or IP address, you know, this number corresponds to this location. Uh, there's a, what they call the management information base or the MIB file. Uh, this is what translate, these, this is what helps translate these numbers into more of a human uh, readable portion. And like I said, you know, 1.3.6.1.4 is the top of the private branch and that's where vendors and our custom RDs are going to live. So, uh, we're going to talk about Python and the SNMP pass persist module for a second. So why did I write it in Python? That's because that's what I know. Uh, just getting some ideas about this when I was first starting out, I found out that you can you can interact with the OID tree structure in Perl. I don't really know Perl. I don't really. I, I'm not a fan of the bracket. So if you want to use Perl, you can use that. So I don't know if any other language.